Hey everyone, my name is Christy. Welcome to my corner. Thank you all so much for joining me today for historical baking episode number six, I think. If you're new here, uh, welcome to my channel. I'm happy to have you hang out with me. And for those of you who are returning, thanks so much for stopping by again and, you know, seeing my baking adventures. This is a channel about embroidery and other textile crafts and baking and history and the history of those things. And so if that is something that you're interested in and you're watching and not subscribed, I'd love to have you subscribe to my channel. That would be awesome. So today, well, I guess today for me is Monday, but this is getting posted on Tuesday, the third, which is in the United States election day. And so I thought in honor of election day, I would bake an election cake out of the National Cookbook by Hannah Mary Bouvier Peterson, which was published in 1856. And this video is slightly different than my other baking videos because I have already baked. So this is like at the end of the process where normally I would take you through the process and not know how it's going to turn out. Today I know how it was going to turn out and it turned out poorly. This, my friends, was a baking fail. But I think I learned something from it and I did an experiment. So here is my, the result of my experiment, which I'll talk about at the end. But the cool thing and the reason why you want to stick around is because I have a special guest today. My friend, Dr. Sue Stanfield, who is an assistant professor of history at the University of Texas in El Paso, studies domesticity and food and citizenship and all sorts of cool things in the 18th and 19th century U.S. And so she has studied cookbooks and she studies election cakes and she bakes election cakes regularly. So she actually joined me earlier today for an interview, which I will splice in at some point here. I don't quite know how this is going to be organized until I kind of do all the editing. So even though you know it was a fail, I'm still gonna take you through the baking process and I'm going to read the recipe to you as well as put it right here so you can take a look at it. And the reason why I didn't do so well is because there's not so much of a recipe right here. It is two pounds of sugar, three quarters of a pound of butter, one pint of milk made into a sponge, four eggs, two tablespoons full of cinnamon, and flour enough to make a dough. Set a sponge the evening before with a pint of milk, a gill of yeast, a little salt and flour enough to make a thick batter. And so this is what that ended up looking like. So I took a little video of that, of me kind of stirring that. So you can see what that sponge looked like. And after that sponged, I realized that this was going to be an enormous cake. So I cut it in half at this point. The next morning, stir the butter and sugar together, whisk the eggs and add it, add to it with the sponge and other ingredients and flour enough to form a dough. That was where I think I went wrong. I didn't know how much flour was enough to form a dough. So it didn't turn out well, as you will see. Knead it, but butter your pan, put in the dough, let it rise. When it is light, bake it. So when it's sort of light and fluffy, bake it. So those are the ingredients and those are the directions that I had to work with. And you'll see what I did with them. So my sponge has sponged. Basically, it just looks like a foamy batter. And that's, I think, what we're going for because it's too thin to rise like a bread, but it's definitely impregnated with all of the yeast. So that's really good. And I've decided to do a half batch of this because I think otherwise it'll be really, really big. And it calls for two pounds of sugar, which is four cups of sugar. And that's just so much sugar, <laughs> so much sugar. So I'm going to do a half batch and I have um, two cups of sugar. I have half of three quarters of a pound of butter. What is that? I don't know. But I have a stick and a half of butter. I have two small eggs, I have my cinnamon, my salt, and my flour, and I'm just using all-purpose flour. I figure we want this to be kind of light and airy as opposed to bread-like, even though it's using yeast, I don't really want it to be bread-like. So I'm going to, um, it says, the next morning, so we're gonna pretend this is the next morning. Oh, and by the way, I did this at, I don't know, around 10 this morning, and it's now six. So I basically let it go overnight, okay? The next morning, stir the butter and sugar together, whisk the eggs and add to it with the sponge and other ingredients and flour enough to make a dough, knead it, 
butter your pan, put in the dough, let it rise. When it is light, bake it. So I'm going to mix the butter and the sugar. Um, I'll crack the two eggs and uh, you know whisk them together. And then I'll put half of this into it to make a half batch. My pan is already buttered. I'm just using a normal loaf pan and I'm hoping that that's big enough. If it's not, I have a second loaf pan back here that I can butter and, uh, and deal with. And then I will just throw in a little bit of salt because the butter is unsalted. And as we know, butter would have been salted and then add in flour until it makes a dough. I'm gonna assume it's not a dry dough. I'm going to assume it's a fairly wet dough. And I will let you know how much flour ends up going into it. So let's do that. In my normal episodes, this is where I would do some voiceover history and give you background on election cakes or talk more about what I'm doing. But because I have a great interview with Dr. Stanfield later on, we're just gonna speed this up and then move on to the next step. So we have a cinnamon, very liquidy batter, and it just says add enough flour to make a dough. So I'm going to go in half cup increments, and I will let you know how many I end up putting in there. good size for a loaf pan. I mean, you saw what it looked like, but it's like that, right? It's not quite full. It has space to rise, which it's supposed to do. Um, you know, it says, let it rise until it's light and then bake it. I'm going to bake it at 350. Well, first let's see if it rises. It's about the consistency of a soft cookie dough, which was not what I was expecting. So we will see if it rises and how long that takes, but it took about three and a half to four cups of flour for this. So I'm very glad that I have the recipe because that would have been a lot of election cake. So we'll see what happens. We'll let it hang out here covered and um, let it rise and see where we end up in the next couple of hours. It's only about 6.30 now, so I have tons of time to let it rise, which is really nice. And then, like I said, I'll bake it for, well, I'll bake it at 350. We'll try like 30 to 35 minutes, but I'll come back and we'll talk about that when it's risen. So let's hope for the best. So we're four hours in. There hasn't been much change. I think I'm just gonna leave it overnight and see if it rises at all, because at this point it would just be like a brick. It's really heavy. We'll check on it in the morning. It has been almost 12 hours and there has been zero movement on this dough. Maybe I added too much flour? I don't know. I'm going to try to make it into a thinner cake and like put it in like a cake pan. I'm wondering if it's just so much bulk. I mean, it's really heavy. I don't know. I'll do some experiments and hopefully something will work and I will be able to show you that in a bit. Otherwise, this may just be a fail, which, you know, is okay. So I'll see you in a bit. I am mid baking of my uh, election cake, which is becoming a disaster, but I'll talk about that at the end. Um, and I'm in my crafting corner as opposed to my baking corner because my baking corner is next to my fiance's workstation. And he actually has work to do without me like yammering about disaster cakes. So um, but luckily, even though the cake is a disaster, I have a special guest today. Uh, my friend, Dr. Sue Stanfield, is an assistant professor at the University of Texas in El Paso. And she is like an expert on food and culture in the 18th and 19th century U.S. And so I thought, if I'm baking election cakes, I got to talk to Sue and see what she says about these cakes. So um, thanks, Sue, for being my first ever guest on 
you know, historical baking. And I think this is episode six or seven, which is kind of cool um, on my YouTube channel. Thanks so much for, for agreeing to do this. I really appreciate it. I'm excited to be here. I love, I love talking cake. I love talking history. So how could I resist? Well, and the reason why I like thought of you first is because you bake election cakes fairly regularly, correct? It's kind of, I think of it as my party trick. So like I get invited to a potluck or we bring stuff to the office. I, I try to bring a historic cake and election cake is what I tend to make. And then mm -hmm. I tell the story of it and people eat it. And some people think it's delicious. Some people think it's not really cake. You promised cake and it's, <laughs> and it's like, well, welcome to the, the 1700s. Well, and, and that kind of leads to my first question. Like, what is election cake? Um, and when when were they a thing? So there are a lot of stories about this. And the one thing, you know, as a historian, I can I can certify is the first time it's published in an American author cookbook happens in 1796 in mm -hmm. Amelia Simmons' American Cookery. And so she publishes this recipe, but it's pretty clear that it has a um, a history to it. It's something that's mm -hmm. existed longer. So Simmons cookbook, oh, it's special because it's the first to use pearl ash. So something to, uh, to make things rise. He has the first U.S. recipes for cookies that's published. Um, mm -hmm. He does election cake, federal cake, um, a lot of different, you know, recipes. She has the first in a cookbook pumpkin pie recipe so it's a it's a really important book for american food history because it's first that looks at sort of local local foods and how, mm -hmm. and how to cook them but anyway so she has this recipe i know from going to connecticut to research there's a long history of it happening at at elections go figure and so even during the colonial era uh, you have colonies hold elections for different positions. And so people would come into Hartford from outside the city and election cakes were served for the visitors. And so it was, was part of the tradition. We know that they existed well before the revolution. Talks I've seen say it starts about 1730, 1740 mm -hmm. in colonial America, but it comes from the British great cake. So there's an older history there. Some people say it was known before the American Revolution as muster cake. So when the- Like the muster, like militia, mustering up troops? Yes. So mm -hmm. when the state militias, our colony militias, would gather, this was something that was served. I don't think that's what it was first known as. I think that was another name for it. But yeah, so it's been around for a long time. In the 1800s, people looked at it nostalgically. So you can see newspaper articles, you know, in the 1830s about your grandmother's election cake. Catherine Beecher and her cookbook um, that goes with her treatise on domestic um, economy has a recipe for Hartford election cake. Lydia Maria Child, who writes American Frugal Housewife, writes about it in letters. So she's a, a political activist, a hardcore abolitionist. Uh, people are always criticizing her for being too political. So she has this <laughs> letter when she says, oh, I don't care about politics. All I care about is my election cake. But we know it's not true because she's right. an editor of a newspaper and writing these, these pieces. But I love that She's like, it's just about the cake, not the politics. No, that's great. And why then are these women baking these, these specific cakes? Um, are they used for like celebration? Are they just like snacks? <laughs> like, are they just dessert? Like what are gatherings? Like, are they social? Like what's going on with these cakes? I, you know, that's something I struggle with and not just this cake. I look at all sorts of political cake, William Henry Harrison cake, Henry Clay cake, Zachary Taylor jumbles. I mean, so there's this whole history uh, starting in the antebellum era of naming cakes and, and desserts after political candidates. And so when I, I've looked at these, it's like, so is this just election time? You know, what happens if you think Harrison cake is really tasty? Well, he dies like 30 days in office, like, do you, do you 
what? Is it to mourn him? Do you still make it? Do you feel bad about eating cake? Uh, you know, so it's hard to tell. I think election cake really does follow the tradition of elections in a mm -hmm. way that these other partisan cakes, you know, a century later, half century later, I think maybe had a, maybe not as much of a lasting power, but not tied to a certain date, you know? Mm -hmm. So election cakes, people tended to make for elections, but they also last a long time. And so, I mean, clearly people are eating them over a mm -hmm. longer period of time. So I'm not really sure, but most of the, the things that I've read, letters and, and uh, newspaper articles, they seem to suggest it is for those specific events. Yeah, and I remember that one, at least some part of your doctoral dissertation was about like domesticity and citizenship. Um, am yeah. I correct in that, in remembering that? Yes. Um, yeah, yes. and I just thought that was such a cool idea. Do these kind of fit into that since women weren't able to access like more traditional political power or voting in the 18th and 19th centuries? Was this kind of a way to incorporate citizenship? I, I, I honestly think that is the truth. I think the election cake in 18th century is, is, a, is a way for women to participate in the process, but not necessarily have a voice. They developed pretty soon um, in the early Republic era, things like Washington cake, Franklin cake. But I, I kind of argue those are non-partisan non cakes, that they're more patriotic than partisan. Mm -hmm. So women kind of go through this function of creating, you know, or, or, or cooking patriotic things to, to give them sort of a link to the state. But I think with Henry, William Henry Harrison cake, for the first time, women are making partisan cakes and being involved in electioneering through the kitchen. And I think it, it makes sense. Harrison is the first campaign that actively recruits women to participate. Mm -hmm. So they have these big picnics. They have, you know, they do toast to him and people speak out. And so I think it kind of makes sense. And then everyone wanted to follow it. And so in 1844, the newspapers start printing Henry Clay cakes. You know, he's the, the next Whig candidate for president. And frankly, I've made both a Harrison cake and a Clay cake. Clay cake is so much better. <laughs> layer cake it has a boiled frosting on it it's like I like this cake I'm not that wild about the Harrison cake but for some reason that one didn't take off in the same way and so you don't see it getting reprinted in cookbooks over the years in the same way the most recent cookbook with Harrison cake I've seen was published in 1959 and they call it the log cabin campaign cake but but it's a Harrison cake all right. So I, I mentioned at the beginning my, in my introduction that my cake is a disaster. And I'm wondering if maybe it wasn't a disaster and I have now ruined it because it wasn't actually cake. So because the election cake that I'm making is more like cookie dough slash bread texture and the dough, is that normal? Are there different kinds of these cakes that have different textures? Did I actually have a successful cake and then ruin it and I should have talked to you first? If this is what I need to know. <laughs> I, um, there are a lot of versions of the cake. Mm -hmm. I mean, a ton. And in fact, uh, when I look at manuscript cookbooks, sometimes you'll see um, three or four different versions of election mm -hmm. cake. So it's not standard. Most of the ones I've seen are bread-like, kind of like a, between a sponge and a bread, but you do, I, I, when you described that it wasn't really rising the second time, I'm like, I do think you have, I think there's a problem. So okay, I think good. Really, um, I don't think you've ruined a cake that's working, but I'm not sure why it would be a cookie like, I need well, to look at the recipe again. Um, yeah, the recipe is vague. <laughs> the recipe is add enough flour to form a dough, knead it, butter your pan, put in the dough, and let it rise. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I don't expect that I will come out of this with anything edible, although it is like butter, flour, eggs, and sugar. So if worse comes to worse, I'll just bake it as cookies and we'll just snack on it. Yeah. You know, that's the good. <laughs> The good thing about this show is that, like, no one's really here for the baking. 
<laughs> well, I, uh, I always cook mine in a tube pan, which is not really historically accurate. You know, at least if you're doing, thinking of the 18th century version. Well, those are all my kind of prepared questions. Do you have anything you want to add? You had mentioned like the size of these cakes. I think that's fascinating. Um, you have a podcast. Tell us about that. Like, tell us anything else you want us to know. Okay. Well, let me tell you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, the first time this recipe shows up, published, I mean, it's in manuscript cookbooks earlier, things like that, is in Amelia Simmons' American Cookery. And here is her version that shows up in the cookbook. And just listen to these amounts. 30 quarts of flour, 10 pounds of butter, 13 pounds of sugar, 12 pounds of raisins, which are, you have to de-seed. When you think about that, it's not like your box of raisins you just pull in. It's like, yeah, that's never going to happen. Three dozen eggs, one pint of wine, one quart of brandy, four ounces of cinnamon, four ounces of fine um, calander seed, three ounces ground allspice, uh, wet the flour with milk to the consistency of bread uh, overnight, and then you add a quart of yeast the next morning. Now, these this has been modernized to the extent that, you know, we're not saying a gill of wine and, you know, butter the you know, size of a dozen, you know, hen's eggs, you know, so the amounts I've adjusted so you can kind of get them, wrap your brain around it, but that's mm -hmm. still huge. And I'm, I still can't figure out how did they cook this? Um, you know, how did this work? But I do know from talking to an archivist in Hartford at the State Historical Society, you know, she says that there's stories of, of women passing out, trying to with their big wooden paddles. <laughs> <laughs> stir things and these huge cakes and and that was part of the legitimacy of your cake too is like how big is it how hard was it to produce I think that that's utterly fascinating I have no yeah. idea if it's true even the little thing like just a little like dough just stirring it is hard I can't imagine having a an ore essentially and doing a whole vat I gave up on that a while ago, um, I used to want to do everything authentic. And it's like, I have a KitchenAid, I'm going to use it. And, <laughs> and every time I do, especially if I'm um, um, whipping up egg whites, I always think of the Little House books when Laura is making her own wedding cake and these happy golden years. And she talks about her arm is stiffer than the egg whites mm -hmm. from you know whipping them for so long. And I think, I love my KitchenAid. It's, it's not worth it to me. Because, I mean, how authentic am I being? I mean, I'm wondering, you know, what is the flour really like? What is the mm -hmm. consistency of the sugar? I mean, there's so many things like that. If I was doing a cooking class or something, I might try to demonstrate some things both ways. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, if someone just wants to have the finished product, I am using everything electronic. I mean, in, oh, yeah. think about in your oven. I mean... I cannot reproduce completely authentic cake. And so mm -hmm. I tire myself out. They, of course, their ovens didn't have temperature gauges on them, right? And so she's like, cook in a moderate oven. And I'm like, all right, well, for me, that's 350. So we're just going to go with 350 and, and see what happens. A slow oven, I do it about 250. A moderate mm -hmm. oven, I think of as 350. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea the truth. This is great. So tell us about your podcast. So I have a podcast. I've been doing it for, I guess, two years now, and it was designed for my U.S. history survey. I teach mm -hmm. U.S. history up through the Civil War. And what I wanted is a way to people to learn history passively. I know we're supposed to do active learning, <laughs> and this is my response. It's like, how about some passive learning? So you can listen to the podcast and be getting dressed in the morning commuting to campus. I wanted to cover things that maybe aren't covered in as much detail. And part of me, maybe it's my arrogance. I was like, no one's going to remember my class a year from now or two years from now. But I thought if we do really good topics for a podcast, maybe there's random things that people will remember five years from now. Not everything, not exactly, but they'll we're like, oh yeah, I I heard about that. So mm -hmm. 
So that's the podcast. It's called Pod Textualizing the Past. And right now I have 19 episodes. So yeah, check it out. It is cool. the, a whole episode on Amelia Simmons and um, historic baking. I interview Rachel Snell, um, a friend I met at a cook cookbook class held at Harvard many years ago, mm-hmm. a one summer class. And she talks about 18th and 19th century cooking and women women's writing through recipes i'll uh she'll send me the link and i'll put that below so you all can check that out too awesome anything else you'd like to add before we before we shut this down i cannot think of one more thing to say about election cake (laughs) except for the boozier the better some people love it i always feel apologetic because it doesn't have a real frosting like i've disappointed people but not everyone wants the sweetest cake ever and it's true and it feels like more of like a pound cake than a iced cake. But just think of it as like an old fashioned coffee cake that rises. Okay. And so think of it as a less dense, sometimes a fruit cake. Because mm-hmm. a lot of them call for currants. More modern versions call for pineapple. I mean, a ton of fruit. And I always think, you know, American excess, you know, of course, <laughs> we're going to keep adding stuff through the centuries. But but it grows. I mean, I, I like it a lot more like on the eighth making than I did the first time I made it. All right. Well, thanks so much for, for joining us today. And um, we will see how my election cake turns out. But I okay. am honestly not very hopeful. But I'll send you pictures and you all will see it like in 30 seconds, if that. Okay. Thanks, Stu, for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for thinking of me. This is fun. So the experiment that I did was I cut the dough into thirds and one dough was a control so I didn't add anything to it I just kind of put it at the bottom of a pan and that was this one one I added at about half a cup quarter to a half a cup of flour that was this one and the third I added a half quarter to a half a cup of milk and that was this one so basically I was trying to figure out was it too wet too dry or was it actually okay the answer was it was not too wet the one with the flour is this one and it is inedible it is like dust in fact the rest of this is already in the trash okay the control turned out okay. I mean, it's like really dense and probably would have made a decent cookie. And I think it'll taste good with coffee and tea. So we'll probably just eat it with coffee and tea and that'll be fine. We drink a lot of coffee and tea in this house. But I think that the most successful one, although still not successful, was the one with added milk to make it a little bit wetter. I think what happened is that I added too much flour because I didn't know what the consistency of the dough was supposed to be. And so I, in my mind, I was thinking bread when I think I should have been thinking wet cookie dough. I don't know. I, I think I might try this again at our next election. I probably won't do it until then. That's for sure. I have other things I'd like to bake, but I'll post a picture of the three of these pieces. Um, and put it right here so you can see kind of a close-up. But overall, this was a fail, which is unfortunate because I was kind of looking forward to this. But this video, I hope, is a win thanks to Dr. Stanfield, who was willing to come and chat with me about election cakes. So I hope you enjoyed learning about election cakes and learning about women in the 18th and 19th centuries U.S. If you decide to try to bake this election cake, and I will put all of the stuff that I did down below. And so you can change it however you like. If you cook it, tag me because I want to know. I'm on Instagram at Dr. Underscore Christy. Please, please, please let me know if you bake this because, or another version of an election cake, because I would love to see it. And I've never had Dr. Stanfield's election cakes, unfortunately, but someday I hope to. And yeah, so this may be the first ultimate historical baking fail at Christie's Corner. But you know what? This is a a learning process and I'm really okay with that. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Um, I'll see you on Friday with a floss tube. I have some fun things going and 
I hope you really enjoyed learning about election cake. Happy election day today. Make sure if you're, if you're American, you go out and vote and I'll see you on Friday. So with all that being said, take care of yourselves and have a good one.